All right, this is Joe Hogan. I like two things, drinking beer and playing rock and roll, and I love the fucking Spoets. Oh, thank you, Joe. Thanks for the interview, man. You oh. got it, dude. Joe! How's it going, Scott? What you doing with that gun in your hand? <laughs> I remember I asked you that question right where the first time I met you, and you just gave me that look. Like, I've heard that so many fucking times. Yeah, you know. <laughs> All right, so uh, what do you remember about uh, about doing Spoets? Well, I remember there was a lot more people than I thought were possibly going to fit in the room that we had to record in. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, I remember after... While we were setting up, about 20 minutes into it, somebody said, oh yeah, the band hasn't rehearsed in seven years. <laughs> and that's when I realized that, you know, it wasn't really about that and everybody had just kind of like come in from a bunch of different places, and, you know, converged on the spot. And, you know, that was cool. And uh, you, you guys you caught me at a good time because, uh, I, for years, have worked in like real traditional, like big studio mm -hmm. kind of setup, and with what you all did, I never would have flown. Or, or like you know, I, I mean, just the craziness of it. Like you know, so many people in the room, no isolation, dudes wandering around, people coming and going, playing different instruments, picking up things. Like you know, it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Work on. So, so what's what's your your big memory about the about the, uh, the recording? Well, I, mean, I did about three or four different sessions, I think, yeah. and uh, you know, we kind of it was a it was a pretty big undertaking seeing it was analog and there was no Pro Tools or anything at the time. Two inch with what you all wanted to do, right? Yeah. I remember there was days where there was three bass players, and, like, you know, uh, you know, horn players just in and out. All kinds of different people, um, and we just sort of slowly built up these tracks after a period of time. No, I hear what you're saying. Excuse me. Busy on my block. So that's cool, man. This is this is New York. That's why we're here. We could we could do we do this in Bluffton, you know, but there'd be nobody there, and then and, and crickets and shit. I tell you, I remember what I remember about you doing the production was that everything would sputter. Nothing, nothing bothered you. Nothing shook you, you know. I, I said, all right, now, now we're going to do the grinder tar, and we're going to break 20 pounds of glass. <laughs> and you were like, over there. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good corner to break glass in. That's a good corner for the grinder tar. Yeah, you guys were a good fit for that studio. That was a good <laughs> spot down there. The grind guitar, that was a lot of fun. I tell people about that sometimes. They're just going, what? They had what? <laughs> Yeah, that was, I definitely remember that. That's the best recording of the grinder guitar we've ever had. The, it's on the Dead Girls thing. It's a, we've got a, a really great solo on Dead Girls the grinder guitar. And I had to like crowbar Chuck off that fucking solo. Like, oh, there's a space here. I'm going to play some bazooki or whatever. I'm going to play me some bazooki. <laughs> and and uh, I said, no, Chuck, that's my grinder guitar. And he gave me that look like, you're playing your grinder guitar on a record? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's just to blind people at shows. That's not for. It's funny. As soon as you plugged it in, it just like played itself. <laughs> it didn't have to do a whole lot, from what I remember. No, no. That's the beauty of the grind. Yeah, that's the tone going. You, 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 you shake yeah. it, you know, or you might mean no, don't shake it, or <laughs> hit it, or not hit it. I was using a slide on the grind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I did some work with Kim Deal and the Breeders. Really? How's how's Kim to work with? Um, that was that was a fun session. You know, I don't think uh, we got we got as much done as we could have. But, uh, you just just stuff. Uh, I know I, I I didn't finish the record with them. I know that. So <laughs> I don't want to say anything bad about them. But uh, you know, I don't know. I hope she got it done. It never hurt. <laughs> well, she got all that all that Breeders money. What the fuck you need? I mean. And she, she did the breeders back when you could still sell records. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. All right, what's that, Chuck? Where are the Luke brothers? Um, Clean and sober and doing just fine. Oh no, I hate to hear that. Where Where are they? <laughs> uh, dude, it was. It got really ugly. They needed to get it together, and they did. Um, 
I do a lot of work for the Blue Man Group. So uh -huh. Basically, who I you know work for now. Yeah. And they ended up buying the studio uh -huh. from Victor. Which one? Loho. Clinton Street. The one under the big one. Oh. Yeah. yeah. That was like a hotel in there. Yeah. I, we never got so, to play in that one. We were always like, we like planning. Some, you and me, we did. We mixed something. We over mixed there something over day. there. Yeah, but I, we were. I was all. I saw it, but I was and always planning to get the Spoets yeah. down to do a show and a yeah. recording and all that. Victor it, mixed the song down there too. Also. Yeah. One song. So uh, you know, he was in a bad place, and they owed like a lot of money and back taxes and things mm -hmm. and stuff. And one day he was just like, I was like, yo, I know somebody that'll take this whole thing off your off your hands mm -hmm. so basically he just like wrote down what he wanted and they bought the whole i mean they bought the fish and the fish tank and everything <laughs> and he just the and walked away what about now the rolling he, stones he truck? runs a, he runs a restaurant over on Ludlow and stamp victor does and eddie i haven't seen in stone age i hope i'm told he's doing well We'll have to we'll have to go go see some Luke's before the world ends yeah, man. now what tell me about Ludlow? tell me about the the rolling stone truck those guys bought the Rolling Stones truck from England, had mm -hmm. it shipped over here, and we did a handful of gigs with it. When they originally bought it, the plan was, oh, this will be great. We'll, you know, go places and like rent a cheap house, like in an off season, and, and you know, do records with bands. But then, uh, once once the other brother, you know, got involved too, was like All putting right. up a bunch of money too. Mm -hmm. it was like, hey, wait a minute. We should be trying to do like, you know, all these other gigs that other mobile companies do. Yeah. You know, only problem with that was our truck was like 30 years older yeah. than all the other yeah. mobile company trucks that were out there. I mean, it sounded amazing, mm -hmm. but you know, we went and did this gig at, at uh, the Tibet Freedom concert mm -hmm. at the RFK Stadium. There, were, like the Bad News Bears, the audio people. Yeah. Was, like, the other truck had doors that opened and closed, like Star Trek. Yeah beautiful and nice. Our thing had a leaky air conditioner hanging out the side of it and got towed into the gig. You know. <laughs> but we did it and it sounded great. Um, the truck got sold this we did uh, we did Patty Smith mm -hmm. here at CDs. I did uh, Matador Records 10 year anniversary yeah. at Irving Plaza, which was like three nights in a row and like I don't know, at least twenty five bands or mm -hmm. something. It was insane. Uh, other things, but after that it got sold to some people in Canada. Uh, I haven't heard a thing about it since. It's probably in a museum somewhere. It should be, man. The thing is a piece of crazy ass piece of history. You know, think of some of your favorite classic rock records were done on that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other stuff too. I mean, Flash's first album. Yeah. You know. Uh Zeppelin IV. <laughs> Walk on the water. Yeah. Exile on Main Street. I mean, shit. That and right. you touched the, the same yeah, faders. Right you touched the faders. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff was there. You know. That could have been the Exile on Main Street thing. The, right. the part of the console where you rest your mm -hmm. arms on, you know, would flip open. Uh huh. It's like there's a stash spot with got some pills in there. Ah, uh, who tried them? There was another spot where all the paint was worn off. It was obviously the cocaine, you know doing section mm -hmm. the, the Gwyn Johns Memorial. <laughs> yeah. And he went to Taiwan with his girlfriend. So. After, like, do you feel like you're a grind guitar master now oh, after, no, after no. having played it once? No, no, no. I think uh, it would take a lifetime to <laughs> master that. I mean, you know, do you still, have you, ref have you, do you still use it? Have I you still use it. it all, I still like, use it. Uh, it's constantly. You different versions, you know? Well, know. it gets broken every show. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not so much put together that you can play it two shows in a row without right. totally refitting it. And right now the headstock's cracked like in half and it's only being held together by the uh, what is it, oil clamps, oil uh, oil filter oh, clamps sure, that yeah, we yeah. have on there. So it's, it's basically being held together with oil filter clamps right now. But we're, we're doing uh, this other thing and, uh, and I've got to get one that's totally, totally wireless. So I've got another guitar and I'm making another grinder guitar. Uh -huh. Wireless grinder, wireless uh, thing and totally like, that, that I can take it anywhere and just attack people in the, in the bar. And it's funny because I come into these shows 
I have these little metal bars. Uh -huh. I tape them I'm everywhere. Oh, just right. tape so one, little tape pieces one of rebar. Little pieces of tape them everywhere in the club. And people just look at me and they forget that I've done it. And then I bring out the grinder trying like 30 feet away from the stage. I hit, boom, there's a piece of metal right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sparks yeah, everywhere, everywhere. Good everywhere. stuff, man. I like that. <laughs> Now we got a, we got a new project going on now. Sun Wukong uh -huh. and the Peaches of Immortality. Robert Williams on uh, drums. Your buddy Robert. Well, but that was the last drummer that y'all. That's in. right. He played with Captain Beefheart yeah, or on, something, right? Yeah, on the dock he at the was, radar station. He was really great, man. We're, yeah. we're we're basically putting together some. I'm doing this film. We're putting together a band to do music, which uh -huh. I know is a stretch for me. Hands and sodomy, I guess. And uh, Joe Hogan, he's a famous uh, music engineer who who's now uh, fucking it up New York style. I gotta give a prop to his new band, Snake Canyon. Snake yeah. Canyon. Oh, I need, I, need, I need one of those. Snake Canyon. T-shirts are coming. <laughs> yeah. So what's, what's it like to work with Chuck here in, in the studio? He's, he's a demanding producer. <laughs> He was more demanding on you guys, I think, than he was on me. Sure. <laughs> well, there was you know? so much chaos going yeah. on there, and I, I just took one look at Joe's face, and he looked at me like, what am I supposed to do with all these people? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I took it upon myself to try and strip it down into like how we're going to record like four people at a time. Yeah. We had like, what, 16 people? Easily. Recording? Easily. At least 16. And people. a lot of them couldn't come back, and, and you know, we, we had different songs that I'm we wanted them on. Day. Yeah. We got to do it yeah. now. Yeah. yeah the, the big one was was uh, was Robert. You know, we wanted to get all of his drum tracks yeah. in. Cause he had, we had what, what, two days with him? Yeah, and we he didn't know what to play on any songs. He oh, didn't I didn't want to, I didn't want to tell him what to play. I want him to play something. I'm the one. You don't get Robert Williams and say, you know, play something ordinary. That was that's why you and you and Robert fought because you wanted like a blues beat for something. Robert, I can play the fucking blues beat. I didn't fly out here from fucking California to play some fucking shit. Get some kid to do that. That's when I jumped on the bass and played bass along to what Robert's drumming. Mm -hmm. And it was just Robert, myself, and you uh -huh. with the sax and vocals. Mm -hmm. And, and we would write songs like that. And Ash. And Ash, yeah. So we had the two saxes, yeah. Scott doing a scratch vocal, bass and drums. And we recorded, I think, almost all of the stuff we did with Robert that way. Yeah. And that we, that and then session we was in, a little bit more contained than some of the earlier ones. And then we went and overdubbed the other, other stuff. Yeah. And just, Get him, get the most we could out of Robert. Right. Because you know, Robert, he's just a fucking madman, you know, as far as his, his talents and all. You know, just... I know he was very talented. I liked working with him. Uh, and job. really, good jobs. Yeah. How did you guys meet him? Oh, well, I had a record label at one time. Uh, uh, I suppose I still do. And uh -huh. how, do you, how do you kill a record label? I don't know. Uh, and I was doing the Spoets record and a couple other things. I was looking for other artists. And one of the artists I found was Zoogs Riff, who I was a big fan of. Zoogs did not have a record label. And we started talking, Zoogs and I. Well, if you know Zoogs is Pat. So Zoogs is like Pat, right? And, but, but at the time, I, was, I did his record, and his regular drummer broke his hand. Uh, so Robert sat in on the, on the session. That's how I met Robert. And, and you know, when I met him, he was just like, man, this drum is fucking great here. Yeah. I need to get some of this. At the time, we had not hired Rick yet, so we had no drummer at all. We had fired our last drummer for idiocy, incompetency, alcoholism, whatever. <laughs> we just fired him, and, and I hated him. And, uh, and it was just like, we don't have a drummer. Let's just get a, get a fucking hired gun. Yeah? Yeah. But you see, Robert, though, he's got to have hotels and shit. He's got to have his pansy ass, like hotels. And, Money, money when he plays, you know. That comes I, with age. I don't know what that is, having to have money for when you play. I, if I just get to wreck a bar, I'm happy. <laughs> if I get to wreck a bar in front of 300 drunk, uh, criminally insane people, that's, that's all I need. <laughs>